wait for the final people to be seated. Good evening. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Ecology, Valerie Jenis, and I'm delighted to see you all here tonight. And I'm also delighted to get to kick us off by welcome you, welcoming you to tonight's event, the Center for Unconventional Security Affairs Awards Ceremony. And it's my pleasure tonight to get to introduce the Chancellor of the University of California, Irvine. It's a little dicey for a dean to introduce a chancellor, it turns out, because you kind of think, what should I say? What should I not say? Chancellor's office sends over some script. You looked at that, and you throw it aside, and you decide what you want to say. <laughs> uh, it got more dicey when I was told, keep it one to two minutes and not a second over. And anybody that knows me know that that direction's not going to work. But I am going to try to keep it short, and I am going to try to keep it meaningful. A nationally recognized academic administrator, academic and administrator, Chancellor Drake is committed, he's passionate, he's our leader at the University of California, Irvine, and I would need way more than one to two minutes to tell you all of the things that he does on behalf of the university. Let me bullet point just a few things. His history with the University of California goes back more than 30 years. I think that's important to know because he begins with the University of California as a medical student. That means he's a product of the University of California. But we here at UCI are most proud of what he's accomplished at the University of California, Irvine in a very short period of time as the chancellor. Since becoming our chancellor in 2005, Michael Drake has launched many new programs including, for example, public health, pharmaceutical sciences, nursing sciences, and of course the law school, the first law school in 40 years in the state of California. More locally in my school, the School of Social Ecology, he also is under his leadership that we were able this year to launch the Masters of Public Policy degree and welcome our first inaugural class of 16 students to that new program. Under his leadership, the campus continues to grow in a variety of ways that we can take a lot of pride in. It's grown in popularity. You don't have to take it from me. Evidence would bear this out. We now receive more than 60,000 applications annually, and the quality of those student applications continues to soar. This year, the median GPA for the 2010 freshman was 3.98. On Tuesday, we had a meeting where we were looking at data on the incoming class for next year. It was just stunning. It was stunning the number of applicants, the quality of students, and near and dear to my heart, and I know the Chancellor's heart, the diversity of those students, the preparedness, and diversity racially, ethnically, in terms of class, but also their life experiences and what they bring to the university, a real source of pride. Likewise, the quality, the quantity, the magnitude, and the diversity of research being done here at UCI continues to soar under his leadership. We use a lot of metrics for how to assess that, but I think events like this are as about as good of a metric as we have, and centers like the Center for Unconventional Security Affairs is emblematic of that soaring. The Chancellor, I'm sure, will say more about that. Issues of concern to the Center for Unconventional Security Affairs are also issues of concern for our Chancellor, and that makes it appropriate that he provide the welcoming remarks. Many of you know from being in the audience when he speaks that he's spoken to hospital administrators, doctors, medical students, many, many people, many, many audiences about what we might loosely call global health. He routinely emphasizes the idea that health includes a broad view of things like water quality, the status of women, human security, fundamental questions about inequality in the societies to which we remain committed and often threaten to divide us. One of the things I most appreciate about our chancellor is that when he thinks about community betterment and health and enriching human lives in the modern era, he thinks broadly and he thinks in big terms, and that's to the benefit and the advantage of the University of California, Irvine. Often when I hear the chancellor speak in public, and I know many of you have had the, the privilege of hearing him speak, the thing that I'm most moved by is his ability to remind us of the importance of what we do here at the University of California, Irvine the importance of how we do what we do, and the importance of why we do what we do, how we do it. So that's a lead in, Chancellor Drake. Um, but it turns out, that was gonna be my final bullet point, but I was just talking with him and something even more important came up, if you can imagine. What could be more important than that bullet point? Um, I now know, did not know this till five minutes ago, that the Chancellor is a closet race car driver. So maybe he'll tell us a little bit about that as well. <laughs> 
for all of these reasons and many, many more, but I will keep within my one to two minute directive. It really is my pleasure to introduce to you Chancellor Michael V. Drake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. That was uh, much nicer than what we sent over, so I, I appreciate it. <laughs> <clears throat> and I think as long as the race car stays in my closet, uh, we're all safe and can be happy. We've had a, a great day here uh, today. Um, uh, Valerie mentioned uh, how many things we do are connected with the world in a, a broader way. And, and today is a special day for us because we've had this uh, uh, great privilege of having two leaders of the world come uh, to spend time with us, to sort of connect the things that we do here on a daily basis with those things that are done with people in different circumstances and in different ways all, all around the world. So it's um, a day we've been looking forward to uh, a lot, and I'm, I'm happy to have you join us and be, and be a part of it. The, uh, they began, um, uh, I don't, many of you may have been there, we had His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama uh, was with us today. I know that several were in, in the audience. and. Um, we have the uh, privilege of uh, hosting the Dalai Lama Scholars uh, program for our students who are going to do things that help to promote and spread peace in the world. And we have a um, Center for Living Peace, which is started by a local philanthropist, Kelly Smith, and, and uh, His Holiness uh, was the third speaker in a series that started with actress and philanthropist and activist uh, Charlize Theron, and then had uh, Richard Branson uh, in the middle, and then His Holiness today. We had a great a great series. And, and so that kind of finished this afternoon. Now this evening, uh, we start with the future of uh, our, our discussions. The um, Center for Unconventional Security Affairs is really uh, a great embodiment of what we try to do as a university, and that is to think uh, broadly and differentially and inclusively about those problems that are most vexing and most challenging to all of us in the world. I, I spoke to Valerie's school a couple of uh, days ago, and uh, someone was talking to me about the budget and how we were reacting to the budget, and I was uh, sort of ticking off some of the wonderful things that we've been doing on the campus, even though we were being squeezed. And I said that one of the reasons we're able to do that is that we have uh, great, uh, brilliant, thoughtful, creative people looking at ways to approach the problems that uh, face us all around the world. And our, our speaker this evening is um, the one who really exemplifies those things. And I'm uh, pleased that uh, our, our I was saying earlier that usually when we have a speaker of this uh, uh, level of importance, uh, he or she will fly in with uh, uh, the suitcase on uh, rollers and, um, and, and then fly out, and it's um, wonderful that Alexander could be accompanied by members of her family, uh, uh, both uh, present and future uh, uh, with. I think that's really a wonderful, uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, a story, a quick story, in my one to two minutes. Quick story is that, that uh, we have two boys, and uh, as they were growing up, we had a uh, family tradition of uh, I'd tell them a story every night. I'd make something up. And uh, when they were roughly seven and ten, uh, I, I was t I was, and they were thoughtful kids. You know, we had that kind of a family. And, um, and so I said, you know, let's talk about what's valuable in the world. What's the most, what's the most valuable thing? And uh, the, the, the older one always was trying to outdo the younger one, but the younger one said, well, the most valuable thing uh, is gold. And, uh, and then the older one said, no, no, platinum is more valuable than gold. <laughs> you know, what do you know? And, and then he said, you know, actually more than that, uh, um, uh, diamonds are, are more valuable than platinum. And then the, the younger one said, well, how about money? Money is really valuable. I think that's a good one. And I said, those are great answers. We talked about it a bit. The answer I wanted them to uh, think of, and the one that I mentioned was air. I said, if you think of the value of air to you or to me, I mean, all these other things that we have or that are out there in the world are great, they do something we, we, we would like for them to do, but let's take air, and let's say you didn't have air for, say, five minutes. Well, that would be a real drag. And then, <laughs> I don't know, how many, how many agree? Okay, so, but, but that would be a real drag. And then the point I was making was that air is free. So isn't that amazing that the most valuable thing, the thing that we need most or care about most really on a daily basis is actually free, as long as we do what we can to protect and monitor it. And we, we know so much about ways, things that we've done to make that most valuable, free, abundant thing uh, polluted and dangerous and send it in the wrong direction and how we've had to kind of correct ourselves to be able to move away from that. And if I were going to think in that same analogy about other things that are like that and, and something else that's um, uh, infinitely valuable but also infinitely abundant, I would think of water. And I think that in the 21st century, that water is really going to be one of those commodities that both links us but also is, uh, has that value that really causes nations to have friction and 
reflects the way that we're dealing with our world and with our, our, our future and the future for our, our next generation. Alexander, Alexander Cousteau is a world leader uh, in uh, the area of water and what water means to us. Her efforts are really inspiring a new generation to look at what we're doing as a, a, a civilization uh, to this precious resource and those things that we can do as we move forward to make sure that it is there for the future. Uh, her family legacy is one of really opening eyes uh, to people all around the world about the beauty that is within us and the beauty that is around us. And it's really inspiring to have her continue that work for uh, generations in the future. Uh, I have to leave. Uh, you are going to have a treat to be able to stay here and listen to the, the, the talk. And let me just say that uh, without further ado, let me introduce to the platform Alexandra Cusco. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, stay, uh, <laughs> with slightly further ado, Richard says. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Too bad. Um, uh, <laughs> so let me rewind a little bit and say um, I'm uh, pleased to have had a, an opportunity to speak with you this evening. And now let me introduce a great friend of mine, uh, Richard Matthews, to come forward and introduce. <laughs> You're probably wishing I just went with that. Um, <laughs> But let me join the, the, our Dean and, and Chancellor in welcoming you all here tonight. And uh, I'll also start with a story. A few years ago, I was, I was on a UN mission. I was working in Rwanda. And my role was to assess the living conditions in refugee camps. And after a day doing this, I decided not to go back to Kigali, but to, to find a place to stay locally. It was quite a remote area. And so I saw a little guest house. It had a high walls. It looked sort of safe. So I, so I went in, and I said to the guy, he was a kid, about 11 years old. He's standing beside, behind the counter, and I said, do you have a room? And he said, yes, we have, we have one room. And I said, uh, okay. And he said, it's $5. I said, okay, I want to stay. I'll take it. So I gave him $5. He gave me the key. He said, I'm going to show you the room. I said, great. So we started walking um, out across the grass, and he said, he said the room's small. I said, I said, that's okay. He said, it's got a, a hole in one of the walls. And I said, I've got some duct tape. I can take care of that. And he said, uh, there's a lot of bugs. <laughs> a lot of bugs. So anyways, as, uh, that night, as I slept in what was really a room designed in hell, um, I, thought about, I thought about somehow, I don't know how this happened, but millions of years ago, the oceans got it right, because the oceans don't have this, these, these insects on the same scale that sub-Saharan Africa has. <laughs> And so for somebody like myself who works a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, any time I can get near an ocean is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. And I say this from experience, an experience I'm sure many of you have had. And I, talking to Alexandra earlier reminded me of this story. Year, a few, uh, well, a long time ago, I, had my, I, I went for my first dive. And it was uh, in French Polynesia. It was my honeymoon. It was something I'd always been looking forward to my entire life. Um, the honeymoon, too. The honeymoon, too. Um, <clears throat> And I was down, I just, I, I was underwater, I just passed the, passed the uh, exam, the, the practical part of the exam. So I, there, there I was, sort of suspended just a few inches above, the, above the, the, the ocean bottom, the sandy ocean bottom, surrounded by a coral reef, 40 feet below the surface, watching my dive buddy pass her exam, and so on. And uh, I saw, coming towards our group, a black tip uh, reef shark which we'd been told were in the waters, but were not particularly dangerous. And the shark came up, and it swam past the dive instructor, past my dive buddy, and hit me in the front of the mask. And uh, it did a big circle, and it came back towards me. My dive instructor came over. This is my first dive. And he looked at me, he signaled, go up. <laughs> so I ascended. There's a big boat there with two big engines and a ladder. I ascended the ladder. And that's what the first time I realized that my nose was gushing blood. I was bleeding heavily into my mask and into the ocean, um, which is probably why the shark was sort of interested. <laughs> but, but all I could think about was what an incredible experience I had just had underwater like that. The first thing I did when I got off the boat, and my, my nose was still bleeding, it bled for three days. The first thing I did was I went and signed up for a second dive. And any, I'm sure lots of people, this is Southern California, so you have, whether it's diving, kayaking, surfing, you know the immeasurable beauty of the ocean. And I think that's proportional 
to the immeasurable importance of the ocean. It's a, it's a source of food. It regulates the world's temperature. It's, it provides all, it, 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 it carries out all sorts of incredible biogeochemical processes. It offers us this huge maintenance-free surface for transportation. It does all sorts of amazing things. And so it's, it's really distressing to see the cavalier way in which we treat it so often. You know, there are, there are areas in the ocean where plastic waste is accumulated on such a scale that they're the size of countries. It's truly unbelievable for something so important. The center I direct here looks at bad things that happen. We look at civil war, we look at terrorism, we look at pandemic disease, we look at financial meltdowns, government failures, horrible things that are on the whole increasing in frequency, increasing in intensity, on the whole things that any one of us could be affected by at any time. But the exposure to, those, to these things is not uniform across the planet. Some people are much more vulnerable than others. Poverty is one of those determinants, but another is environmental stress. Environmental stress plays a dual role. It is increasing the incidence of some of these horrible things. And where it's really acute, it also increases the vulnerability of people to them, reduces their ability to handle, to manage those things. The greater the environmental stress, the greater the problems we have. But we do not need, and we've heard a lot of people talk about it, we don't need to drive the planet, the human part of the planet, off a cliff in the next 50 years. There's things we can do to change the alarming trends that we see. The other part of the center I direct focuses on what we can do. And we do a number of things. One of the things we do is we cultivate leadership. We believe that it's important that the next generation of leaders has to understand the world that they want to lead in. And the way to understand it is to go out there and experience it and observe it and listen to the people living in it. And we have sent students all across the world to every continent, every, to all sorts of countries from literally Afghanistan to Zimbabwe to observe, to learn, to come back with a better understanding of the world. We promote sustainability because we believe sustainability at the household level, the business level, the government, and our government could certainly use some lessons in sustainability. We, we believe that sustainability, making things more efficient, is generally good for everyone. And as it reduces pressure on the environment, it's, it makes it easier for us to manage these problems that are occurring more and more frequently. We promote social enterprise. I have a, we have a program in social enterprise where we try and allow students to nurture ideas and bring them to the point where they might actually be able to be implemented. And we have incredible ideas. Alexandra and Jonathan were visited this class today and, and gave the students some of the tips. Because we believe, another premise of the center is that, is that if you take your life story, your autobiography, and you link it to addressing one of the daunting social issues of our day, and you do it in a way which makes sense from a business perspective, then you will be one of the primary authors of the next chapter of human history. And that's what we want our students to be doing. We also honor people. We honor people who we believe have played an important and inspiring role. People who stand out because they have stood up for something and made a difference to the world. And these people who we've honored over the years share certain traits. They, I've, I've got to know many of them very, very well. They all have a profound reverence for the past. They appreciate that the privileges we have today are the result of struggles waged by earlier generations, by their vision, their willingness to go the distance, to make a better world for us. We've inherited a tremendously remarkable world in all sorts of ways. And these people have that reverence for the past, but they're not naive about it. They also know that we face some daunting challenges today, some big challenges. We're the generation which, for the first time, is experiencing challenges on a truly planetary scale. But these people we recognize, they're not beaten. They don't, they don't look at the, at the complexity and the magnitude of the challenges and say, nothing can be done. In fact, quite to the opposite. They say, OK, what can I do? I've got a lot of tools in my dispo at my disposal. What can I do? And they take a step, and they take actions. And we believe that every single one of them has the potential to empower and inspire future generations. 
On the basis of those criteria, reverence for the past, a mature appreciation of the challenges we're facing today, actions that have the potential to inspire the future, make the future proud of us. It was easy for us to select Alexandra Cousteau. The legacy she's continuing, I know all of you are familiar with. Her grandfather really introduced this invisible world of the oceans to us through his innovations and his conviction that it was important that we needed to understand it. And his story is a remarkable story, the story of her, of her father, her uncle, her brother. It's a remarkable family. But Alexandra, Alexandra understands that tradition, continues it, but she's brought her own twist to it. She's expanded beyond the oceans to look at our water world. She understands, she brings into her world the scientific findings of the past two decades, which really help us to understand the magnitude of what we're up against. And her focus on those communities who were vulnerable to changes in the quality and the quantity of water, as water gets reallocated around the world, those communities, what their needs are, giving them voice, encouraging them to discuss it, encouraging them to make this part of their daily experience so that we don't run ourselves off a cliff. So that in 50 years, the next generation looks back and say, they made some good decisions. They showed some guts. They had a vision and they found a way to move the world towards it. So those things happen. Alexandra Cousteau is a remarkable individual a graduate of Georgetown University, a master diver. I never got anywhere close. I think I got the Club Med card. <laughs> a master diver, National Geographic young explorer, an author, a photographer, the founder of Blue Legacy, and a tireless steward of our water planet. Please join me in welcoming on stage this year's recipient of the Human Security Award, Ms. Alexandra Cousteau. hear me? Very good. Well, um, thank you, Professor Matthews. Professor Matthews and I actually go back a long time, um, over a decade, I think. And um, he taught me at Georgetown University. And I think after hearing him speak, you can understand why he was one of the most influential professors I had one of the most important teachers that I had the privilege of studying with. And he was important um, because he inspired me to look at the world in a different way. And that's what any good teacher does, is to, he, he, he basically taught me math, which is pretty impressive because I'm terrible at math. Um, he taught me A plus B equals C. And those variables were the environment, war, peace, um, migration. He introduced me to philosophers and in, in the issues that I care about, leading thinkers that changed my worldview. And, um, and I owe a lot to you. Thank you, and thank you for the honor that you have given me today. Um, it's, it's also a pleasure for me to be here with my family because I travel. Um, seven months a year or more. And a lot of that travel is done on my own, with my little suitcase, fly in, fly out. Um, and tonight I'm here with my beautiful mom, Jan Cousteau, who is a much more veteran explorer than I am, and, um, and it's always wonderful to have her. My Aunt Patty, my husband Fritz, my other family, Lily and Elijah, and my business partner and thought partner, Jonathan Smith, who really deserves oops, so much of the credit. Um, for, for this award because we started Blue Legacy in 2008 and it's been a challenge um, and it's been a great privilege to work with you. Can you hear me? Oh no, what I was saying was so important. 
Is that better? No? I'm turned on. I'm good? Okay, good. So, um, a little bit about how I got here. I, um, I'm a water baby. <laughs> that's, that's where it started. And um, my, uh, my parents started teaching me to swim when I was just a few months old. Right before they took me on expedition, I think it was part of the preparation for going on a Cousteau expedition. You had to um, know a little bit about swimming. And, um, and we were on expedition from the time I was four months old um, on for several years through Latin America and Africa. And uh, it, was, it was an extraordinary privilege to grow up on expedition with my father and my mother and the crew. Um, I, people ask me why I do what I do, and honestly, I think I was brainwashed from birth. <laughs> I imprinted on a group of a dozen Frenchmen wearing Speedos and <laughs> red caps and drinking wine and carrying around cameras like a baby bird. And, um, and so it's, it's driven me to get back in the field every chance I get. And um, when I was seven years old, my grandfather taught me to dive. And um, that was an incredible day because it showed me that there is so much more to this planet than we experience here on land. You know, my, my grandfather pulled back the curtain on over 70% of this planet not so very long ago, just 60 or 70 years ago. People couldn't imagine what was under the surface of the ocean. And that's so hard for us to, to, to wrap our minds around today because it's everywhere. We, we have people like, like the McGillivries who've given us wonderful films and the tradition that, that my grandfather started of opening our eyes to what we have and what we stand to lose. But back then it was all new. And, um, and so when my grandfather took me to dive, we, um, we were in the Mediterranean off the coast of southern France. And I was seven, very skinny seven-year-old. And um, we went out on a boat, and he had fashioned little dive gear for me. And so I had a little mask. I had a tiny little tank on red rubber suspenders <laughs> and, um, and little flippers. And I was quite nervous because, well, and the only thing that wasn't little, I have to say, was the regulator. The regulator was huge. <laughs> I could barely see over it. Um, but uh, I was nervous. I couldn't imagine that this thing that I had in my mouth would actually allow me to breathe underwater. It was so, um, such a strange thought. And so we shuffle up to the side of the boat, and he's standing next to me, holding my hand. And I look down at the water, and I'm terrified. And I love the water. I've always loved the water. I mean, I, I learned to swim so young. It feels like home for me, but I was really scared. And he, I look up at him, and he looks down at me, and he gives me one of his signature winks and pushes me in. <laughs> um, and it, it was extraordinary. I immediately realized that this regulator, I could barely see over it did work. It, I could breathe. I swam down, and I found myself in the middle of a school of small silver fish. They must have been like little sardines. And they surrounded me in this big ball, and they all moved in unison as if they were dancing to some music that I couldn't hear. And it was extraordinary. It was the day that I fell in love with our oceans. And as time went on, I thought often about what my grandfather told me when I would ask him countless questions, millions of questions. And he'd get tired, I think, of answering all of my questions. And, and finally, he would say, Alessandra, I can't answer all of your questions right now. So one day, you'll just have to go and see for yourself. And I have, in so many ways. Um, I've, I've been incredibly fortunate. And every time I go and see, it changes how I understand our world. It changes the connectivity of the issues that I experience or that I hear about or read about. It changes how I imagine solutions. It changes how um, the people that I meet inspire me to think about things. And you know, it, since I am always trying to get back in the field and on expedition to places where um, 
I feel completely alien and yet strangely completely at home. Um, I've, I've been to a lot of places and recently um, I've had the great privilege of going on two epic expeditions, epic for me, epic for my team, epic for the work that we do. And in 2009, we did a global expedition across um, five continents. I had a crew of um, six people that I had collected from around the world who were exceptional. And we made films. We made films that we hoped would shape conversation, that would get people to think about things in a different way, get people to talk about the issues, just talk about them, agree with us, disagree with us, just start talking and learning about water and all the ways that water shapes our world, shapes our land, shapes our experience of, of life, shapes the quality of our health and the quality of our communities. And so we did this 100-day expedition across, across the world, and we came back, and people said, wow, Alexander, that was an amazing trip, just amazing. But, you know, good thing that that global water crisis thing that's happening everywhere else isn't happening here. And so Jonathan and I looked at each other and we were like, oh, great. Now we've got to do one in North America. <laughs> so last year, we launched a 138-day expedition across North America. And we went from Canada through the United States and Mexico, had a crew of 13. We, um, we repurposed John McCain Straight Talk Express, made it into a biodiesel mobile workstation for our crew to be able to film and edit and tell stories from. We visited a lot of communities, and I'll show you just a quick reel from that so you can get a, an idea of what that was like. So um, it, was, it was a great trip, and, and what I learned, um, I think what we all learned more than anything else, was the importance of watershed first thinking. You know, we, we, we approached this issue with so many assumptions that we'd learned and studied about and talked to experts about, but there is nothing more um, powerful than standing where the Colorado River used to reach the sea and where now there's nothing but a desert or going out with fishermen in Louisiana and hearing their tale of woe at what they've lost. Um, that kind of experience, I think, brings home these issues in a whole new way. Certainly they did for us. And we, more than ever before, want to challenge people to think about the systems that connect us, these water systems, these water treasures that connect us all, that regulate the resiliency of the supply of water that we need. Um, and do we have enough water where we need it, when we need it? That's a fundamental question. Um, and the other fundamental question is, can we swim in our water? Can we eat the fish from our water? 
can we drink our water? And increasingly, the answer to that question is no. Over 60% of our freshwater resources here, the streams and creeks and rivers that we have, that we've always relied on, um, are, are degraded and polluted. And, um, and these are issues that affect all of us in our very own backyards. And I think um, there's no more poignant example of this than the Colorado River. It's one of the great iconic rivers of this continent. It shaped the history and geography and culture um, and society of the American Southwest. Without the Colorado River, we would not have so many of the communities that we treasure in this part of the world. And just like a glass that we put too many straws into, that river is running dry and hasn't reached the sea in over 12 years. It hasn't had consistent base flows in 50. And we have broken one of the great water systems of this country. We did, um, we did a short film about it, which I'll share with you now. And I'm not going to say very much about it because it speaks for itself. But I will say this, that as tragic as what happened is, we are fortunate with what happened in the Colorado River because we can take it back. This is a system we can restore. This is water that we can get back. And that is one of the most important lessons. Because treasures like this, we don't have all that many of left. And we believe that it is our generation's responsibility to protect the treasures we have and restore the systems that we've lost. Because the next generation will find that it's too late. So here's one of the great challenges of our time is to get the Colorado River to run back to the sea. So this, this very place mm -hmm. is where the Colorado River once raged into the sea. Right. And it spread all the way to the mountains? Yeah, from here all the way across into Baja California to the mountains over there. Wow. This is just mud and tidal water, no, no river water. This endless mudflat was once the mouth of the Colorado River's delta. It covered an area the size of Rhode Island, nearly two million acres from Arizona to the Sea of Cortez. We journey into Mexico and discover for ourselves why a river must reach the sea and what happens when it doesn't. We are in the town of San Luis, Rio Colorado. I can tell you in just five minutes, our world has changed dramatically. Everything is different. Hello. Hola, Oswald. Mucho gusto. Muy bien. Oswald Hinojosa has been fighting for the Colorado for 15 years. As an ornithologist, he realized that birds disappearing as the river dried up indicated a wider environmental catastrophe and began his battle to restore flow to the dry riverbed. This area used to have a river flowing through it. And not just the water, but also a forest of cottonwood with trees with a lot of wildlife in it. And what is the sand? What, where does it come from? Well, basically, this is just uh, the erosion from the Grand Canyon. This is the Grand Canyon yeah. that I'm holding in my hand. That's right. Nosotros ahí nos bañamos, nos tiramos clavados de arriba de los árboles hasta mero al río. Son pescados muy grandes había. Estaban los bagres así, les digo. <laughs> y mojarra negra, pero así no las estaba. Y ahora como el río ya, ya está secando, ya tío. 
de lo poquito pescado que se está muriendo. Ay, qué susto. All but one tenth of the Colorado's river is allocated to the seven U.S. states north of the border. What's left is extracted here at Morelos Dam, just inside Mexico. Una de las recomendaciones para para México y Estados Unidos era construir presas para derivar las aguas que se iban a distribuir a México en los ríos Colorado. Prácticamente toda el agua está asignada a las actividades agrícolas y urbanas. Cerca del 10% del agua que se recibe en este sitio va hacia las ciudades de Mexicali y de Tijuana. Entonces, no hay un agua o una, un volumen de agua asignado para el medio ambiente. Es por eso que no podemos eh, derivar ni una gota hacia el sur, salvo en que existan condiciones de, de excedente. And how far does this extend, this desert? Oh, for miles and miles. There are thousands of acres like this, just bare soil. Oh, so this really is dead land now? Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. This, this way. So there were steamboats here? Yes, there going was. Going up to Yuma? Going all the way to Yuma from the Gulf of California. And trees and water and... Yeah, a delta jungle. <laughs> so, so are we lost? Because <laughs> I feel lost. Eighty years ago, this was a wetland of forests and deep emerald lagoons. The mesquite and cottonwood forests, the marshes, the jaguar, deer, and countless birds and fish have all fled or disappeared forever. It took just one lifetime for upstream dams to stop the river and destroy it all. So here you get to see the joys of filmmaking in the Mexican desert. A rope and cable. We're buried to the frame on the back end. We may have found our savior. Oh. Algo? ¿Una cuerda? Sí. Oh, gracias a ustedes. Para allá. Sí. Para allá. Y después, y después que ya que esté en lo, que esté, lo duro, tú le vas a frenar. Vamos a tocar. Okay. Juan Butron was one of the first locals to discover the last major wetland in the Delta, and he has witnessed firsthand how water can restore life to this parched land. Para mí es muy importante porque allí se reproducen toda especie de, 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 de peces. Allí van a desovar. Es importante para la naturaleza, para el medio ambiente. Y ya la agua debe llegar al mar. In a small fishing village on the shores of the Sea of Cortez, the final chapter of the river's loss is told in disappearing fisheries and fractured communities. The loss of the river destroyed the nurseries of the Gulf, the Delta's estuaries, where the life of the sea once flourished. Este, porque si, si, si esa agua llegaría para acá, también el, el, las curvinas o, los, o, o el camarón sube para arriba también, o me imagino que que si, si soltaría mucho más el agua, se, se expandería más en, en todo lo que es aquí enfrente del Golfo, todo esto. De ahora que ya, que ya no, no hay agua, sí le batalla uno más para, para pescar. It has been over 50 years that it has no longer reached the sea. We forget that the river forms a connection between the Rocky Mountains and the Gulf of California. 
and we just think about the water that is needed in Mexicali or Las Vegas. We forget about the environment, we forget about the deltas, and for sure we forget about the sea. The sea really needs the water. Marine life really needs the water. It would take just over 1% of the river's flow, and the Colorado would reconnect with the sea. River estuaries are the most productive parts of the world's oceans. When we lose them, we are all impoverished. Um, a big challenge, but there is a big solution. And um, we're excited to start working on that solution this year um, with a new campaign that we'll be announcing soon. But. Um, you know, I'll, I'll close these remarks with a few thoughts. My, my um, people, people often ask me what my grandfather would think of what's going on today and, uh, and of the work that we do. And I think he would be overwhelmed by the challenges that we're facing. We have so many challenges ahead of us and challenges that, as I said before, this generation has to tackle because we're running out of time. And challenges that weren't really even on the radar when my grandfather was still with us. Um, challenges like ocean acidification and climate change. Things that really have the potential of changing our world dramatically within the next few decades. But I think he, um, he would be equally inspired by the work that people are doing to address these issues. And I don't just mean scientists who are doing a huge part of the work and whose work is incredibly important, but I mean people, everyday people, people who look around their own communities and say, you know what, I'm going to change this part of the problem. In Minnesota, when we were on expedition, I met a, a lovely couple um, who decided to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary by planting rain gardens for their neighbors. That was their celebration. And so they got a band on a Saturday afternoon, some landscapers, and they went from one garden to the next and gave their neighbors the gift of water by preventing runoff from reaching their creek. Um, that's inspiring to me. Or the little girl that goes out every weekend and sells lemonade so that she can donate the, the, the money that she makes that way to help other little girls have water in Guatemala at their school so that they don't get disease, so that they can have an education, so that they can have as close to a full life as possible. She gives them the gift of water. And that's um, so, so inspiring. And I think he would be also very, very excited about technology. You know, my, my grandfather was a technology geek. Um, and from, from the very beginning, I mean, he started his films when he was 14, 15 years old, and black and white silent movies with the Model T Ford and the good guy and the bad guy, and he, of course, was the bad guy. And he'd hide behind a tree and um, kidnap the pretty girl who then became the damsel in distress. And, um, and that was when he was just a teenager. He was started, started telling stories. And, and later on, when he got the Calypso and his, um, his career with the French Navy and the French Resistance was over, and he um, he started innovating new technologies and for storytelling underwater. Um, he and my <laughs> he and my grandmother would go under the covers in of their of their bed and splice together still film into reels that they could film underwater with, and so they would then take the camera, put it in a bell jar. Um, be able to film maybe 30 seconds at a time, bring it back up, didn't know what they'd gotten, but somehow they put together films this way in the very beginning. Um, he, he designed a two-person submersible so that he could go deeper and see what was down there. He was one of the first to do that. And, and that childlike passion and interest in, in things never left him. I think that was the greatest gift that he gave me was the example of how to be eternally um, amazed by the world around us. And in fact, when, um, when I was 15 or 16 and I was in Paris, 
we went to one of his favorite restaurants, which was a Vietnamese restaurant in Place Victor, Victor Hugo in Paris. And we sat there and we were talking and he wasn't listening to a word I was saying. I said, Chic, why aren't you listening to me? He's like, shh, like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm eavesdropping on the couple over there. <laughs> I was like, you're eavesdropping on the couple over there, but what, how? He's like, I just got my new hearing aid. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked. And he did have a new hearing aid. It had these little green antennas sticking out of his ears. <laughs> and he had a remote control. And so he could actually control who he eavesdropped on in the restaurant. <laughs> um, so I got to hear all about this poor couple's first date. It was quite entertaining. Um, so he would have been very excited about the technology that we have today, the, the ability to do something that he would have loved to do, which is to make his work interactive, you know, to give people the opportunity to go along with him and experience the issues with him. Um, he would have loved giving people the opportunity to write themselves into his stories and tell their own stories in the process. And, and that's what we can do today, and that's very exciting. And I think, you know, um, in case you hadn't noticed. My husband and I are expecting our first child this summer, which is very exciting for us. And, um, and it gives me ample occasion to think about the world that she's coming into and how that world has changed in just four generations, because she's the first, genera the first member of the fourth generation of my family. And so we go from you know, 70 years ago, not knowing what was under the surface of the ocean, to today knowing exactly what we have and knowing what we have to lose and exploring ways to protect what we have. And that, to me, is the spirit of exploration today. It's not about climbing Everest for the first time, because that was done a long time ago. And it's not about being the first to go to the bottom of the ocean, because that, too, has been done, and everything in between practically has been done. There's very few places in the world that no one's ever been to. To me and to a lot of the other explorers that, that I know, exploration today is about seeing the places that we know with fresh eyes, seeing new solutions, seeing new ways to engage. And that is something which is so exciting to me because it means that we can all be explorers. We can all participate in shaping the world around us, in taking the water back that is in our own communities, in our own backyards, in making sure that these resources that we all depend on equally are available to the next generation. And I think when I, I, mean, when I think about human security, I think about my baby, and I think about the world that she'll live in. And to me, security isn't just military security or food security or energy security, which are all obviously very important. But it's, um, it's the ability to, the opportunity, rather, to live in a world where she can breathe the air, drink the water, and live in security without being afraid of the pollution and the degradation of this world. That you know, her, her arrival marks a passage in time. And um, she will begin this generation of challenge to protect it. And that's incredibly important because that world needs to be as secure as it has been in the past. And it falls to us to explore those solutions together. Um, so thank you for this evening and for having me, for coming tonight. It's been a pleasure to be here and see this extraordinary campus and meet some of the, the wonderful deans and professors and students. And um, good night. questions and there's microphones here so if you have a question
please signal and we'll get you the microphone. Um, thanks very much. So any questions? We have one here. You know, um, if you know my grandfather's work, you know that was an issue that, that he discussed a lot. I personally believe that we have enough to go around. I also believe that the way we manage it is irresponsible and um, cavalier and not sustainable. If we were to embrace new technologies, the challenge of research and development, the challenge of doing things the way we can do them if we really work on doing it right, we have enough to go around. We have enough water so that everybody can live in dignity with drinking water and sanitation. We have the ability to grow our food in a much more sustainable way. We have the ability to do all of these things, except we choose the status quo because it's easier and because there are entrenched interests that want it to continue that way. And that's where we have to step up to the plate. I really truly believe that we all have a role to play in shaping this world and we're not gonna stop people from being born. Um, but we can change the conditions of the life that they have once they're here. And that is something we all need to work on together. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think that part of the problem is this really fragmented way we have of approaching water resources generally. Um, you know, we, in, in the scientific world, we have very narrow specialties. Um, we have research and science that's happening on very specific local resources. So we'll, we'll look at lakes separately from rivers, separately from atmosphere, separately from groundwater, separately from oceans. We look at our systems in a fragmented way when we, 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 we study them. We also look at them in fragmented ways when we write policy for them, when we manage them, and when we engage with them as individuals and as communities. If you look at our national um, institutions and agencies for managing our water, it's split between the EPA, the USGS, um, the NOAA, and a handful of others. And that fragmentation is replicated at the state level, at the local level. Um, so I think we need to start by understanding that we have great systems, like the Colorado River, the Mississippi River, um, the Great Lakes, the Chesapeake Bay, and that those are systems, that there are watersheds that must remain intact. And, um, and if we had a, a policy, a, a way of understanding our water that was different, radically different, that looked at it from a systemic view, and we, we implemented it not only through our agencies but also through our own decisions and, and choices as consumers and individuals, I think we would have a very different America than the America we have today. And we wouldn't have to make decisions and choices between farmers and fish the way we had to here. Because frankly, it's not a conversation about farmers and fish. It's a conversation about broken systems and drought. And even if you get rid of the fish tomorrow, next year when there's still a drought and there's still a broken system and there's still not enough water to go around, who are we going to pit against the farmers? Industry, municipalities? How are we going to make decisions? I think that needs to be something that we all think about. Um, because we can get rid of the fish. You know, I mean, I don't think we should, but, but even if we did, we would still have the same problems when we wake up tomorrow. So understanding our water as from, with, a, with a systemic view to the future, the long-term perspective, and trying to bridge the gaps between the way we've fragmented it at every single level of society, it would go a long way towards fixing these problems.
um, us not doing anything about the challenges that we know we have. And, uh, you know, it, it, <laughs> I spent two years living in Costa Rica, and when I was there, you know, sort of the whole point of me moving to Costa Rica was to really get experience in local communities, on the ground, with very real issues. And, um, and so I spent two years traveling all over Central America, working on um, different campaigns against shark finning, um, against illegal fishing, um, working to build protections for marine protected areas, um, I worked with everyone from heads of state to students to very, very, very poor communities. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the big challenges that we have with, with an, the big challenges that we have when we're thinking about how to solve these issues is that we don't take those people and those places into consideration. And, um, and a lot of the people that I worked with, people from other big nonprofits, um, names that we all know that I won't mention, that they're representatives who went into the field with me, who worked within these communities with me, who saw that these people can't fish in waters that they've fished in for generations because we've overfished their waters for them. We've taken their red snapper. We've taken the species that they've depended on time, the year after year after year. And, um, and so we would go as a group to these communities and work with these fishermen and then we would leave. And we would go have dinner somewhere and talk about the day, talk about the work that we'd done. And what did they order? red snapper. There is such a disconnect between what we say and what we do. And that's the problem. And yeah, it's amazing to me that we all know the oceans are getting overfished. And yet we persist in ordering the same 12 species when we go to a seafood restaurant over and over and over again. And it's no wonder that swordfish and all of these other species are on the brink of extinction. Chilean sea bass, we keep ordering it, but it's not because it's on the menu that it's sustainable. And you know, ocean acidification, it's the scientific reality that it's happening in certain parts of the world. And if we continue to emit carbon emissions, it will continue to get worse. We know this, we can replicate this in laboratory experiments. We know what happens when the oceans get more acidic. It takes out the base of the food chain. What are we doing about it? It's not gonna happen unless we make it happen, period. The environmentalists are not going to come save the world for us. Neither are the politicians. We need to make those decisions in our everyday life and we need to make them every chance we get and we need to talk about it to the people in our life so that they can be part of the solution as well. And if we don't do that, then nothing will change. But I believe that we will do that because we don't have an alternative. We have time for one more question. Um, as a graduating senior, I'm not exactly sure what my future holds, and so I guess my question for you is, in your travel across America, um, do you think, uh, or what position would you say has the biggest impact on America's public? Would you say like policy makers or um, advocacy? Um, what? position do you think holds the most power to educate and make a difference um, in the lives of most Americans? Are you asking for advice? <laughs> okay. Then my advice to you is the same advice I give anybody who asks me that question, um, which is to 
do something with your life that makes you feel alive. Because the world needs a lot of things. We need to end world hunger. We need to end the sanitation crisis. We need to end the AIDS crisis. We need to stop war. I mean, we have all these needs, these critical needs in the world and in this country as well. But what we don't have enough of are for people who wake up in the morning and feel alive because they love what they do and they feel like they're making a difference. And that's what we need. We need you to feel alive by what you do. And if you do that, then you will make a difference in whatever it is that you choose. Does that make sense? Thank you so much. Still, we, we're, not, we're, we're not quite finished, and I'd like to invite Dean Janess and the uh, chair of the CUSA Advisory Board, Frank Quinlan, up onto the stage for a second. Dalai Lama this, this afternoon put on a baseball cap uh, because Congratulations.